So, hi. So, I, I will be presenting now the work of um, my postdoctoral fellow, Andrea Neves Carvalho. And this part of the work that we are doing in the lab is focused on uh, understanding the function, the normal function of a taxin 3, uh, and also how it may relate to the disease process. So, uh, as we have heard before, ataxin-3 is a, a protein that initially was discovered to have structural, structural homologies to ubiquity in hydrolases and actually shown to have this activity in vivo. It does possess ubiquity in interacting motifs. Um, is present both in the cytoplasm and in the nucleus of the cells. And we, so we know that it has a ubiquitylating activity. Uh, and this activity may serve for two purposes, either to facilitate the entry of substrates uh, in the proteasome, so actually facilitating the degradation of these substrates, or opposite to retard the degradation of these, pro these proteins by keeping them um, less ubiquitylated. Uh, again, additionally, we actually, we know some substrates, uh, proven substrates of a taxin-3 by now, by now, but there are very few. And so we're still looking for additional ones. And we know that there are, uh, you know, interactors of a taxin-3 related to many different functions. Some of them may be, uh, and for instance, Parkin has been shown to be a ubiquitin, uh, ubiquitin hydrolase target of a taxin-3, but for others, we still don't know. And we have focused a lot, and our interest is, is very much on nuclear uh, partners of a taxin-3 and perhaps substrates of a taxin-3. Because the work, um, for instance, by the Thorsten Schmidt and, and others, uh, has shown that in mouse models, if you keep the protein out of the nucleus, it is much less toxic. So we really think that you, nuclear partners are relevant and perhaps the nuclear substrates. So in order to find uh, substrates of a taxin-3, we took an unbiased approach. We used proteomics. We used a model, a cell model. Um, can I point here? No. Uh, so we used the cell model uh, in which we of neuronal-like cells that we are able to differentiate in vitro to look and behave like neurons. And we silenced the taxin-3. And then using those cells, we, we went to see what, uh, what was the change in the global pattern of ubiquitylated proteins. And we saw several proteins which were changed in terms of their ubiquitylation levels. And what, so some of them related to different functions that you can see in the, in the graph below. And in green, we highlighted those that um, were, so these were related to functions that we had not thought of before for a taxin-3, which had to do with RNA uh, metabolism, uh, processing, and splicing. So that was something that had not been explored in terms of the function of this protein. Uh, and this is a list of some of these proteins, of the proteins that are changed, uh, either up, uh, regulated, so, so more present in the ubiquitylated fraction or less present in the ubiquitylated fraction. And so several of these proteins were related to mRNA splicing, uh, which is a process, uh, as everybody knows, uh, involved in maturing uh, the mRNA for then to produce a protein later, but also very relevant in generating diversity between cells. For instance, we have the same gene giving origin to different proteins at different moments and in different cells. And so this is an important mechanism. And particularly in neurons, we know that this is a very relevant process. Uh, we know also that this process is regulated by, so that there's some factors that are always present for splicing to occur, and then there are others that are regulators, and so may uh, be part of this diversity choice. So the first thing that we, we saw, because we had seen these changes in ubiquitylation, was to see is splicing going well in cells that don't have a, a, a vaccine 3. And using, uh, in the top part, we, you can see we used some reporters, uh, so vectors in which we can assess if the, the splicing is occurring well. And for different reporters, we always see decreased efficacy of splicing when we silence a taxin-3. So that was a clue that something was wrong with globally, with the splicing. And also then we did a, a special type of microarray analysis looking all over the genome for splicing changes. And we saw a large number of um, genes actually uh, that uh, almost 2,000 genes with different regulation of splicing. So something also is perturbed in this sense. Uh, and this type of splicing affected uh, is displayed in, 
because there's different uh, ways of combining the exons, the types of change are uh, shown here. One of these, I will just focus on one particular part of the story. There's, so there's many genes, as I told you, but one uh, splicing factor that called our attention was uh, SRSF7, because this has been known to uh, be a key regulator of the mRNA splicing for tau, which is, I think, as you know, <laughs> a uh, protein that is relevant in several <coughs> subtypes of neurological disease, Alzheimer, frontotemporal dementia, so different, uh, different neurodegenerative diseases. And so SRSF is involved in deciding whether um, uh, this exon is kept or not in the mRNA, so exon 9, I think, and 10, I never know the num number of the exon. And then deciding, so this will lead to two different proteins with three repetitive regions or four repetitive regions that have different functional properties in terms of promoting the microtubule uh, assembly and so, uh, and dynamics, basically. So we went to see what was happening um, in cells liking a toxin 3 to this process of tau splicing. The first thing that we saw is that indeed uh, we confirmed the proteomics data that we have a reduction of um, the abundance of the splicing factor, both overall and in the nucleus. And when we block the proteasome, this is rescued. That means that what's happening in cells lacking a toxin 3 is that this factor is being more degraded by the proteasome, suggesting that normally a toxin 3 is saving it from degradation. And indeed, when we look at the half-life of the protein in cells lacking a taxin-3, it's much faster than degradation. It starts slower, but also goes uh, faster. Uh, and then we looked at the target of this factor for our uh, 3R uh, mRNA, and we see that the 4R, which would be the inclusion of that exon, is indeed uh, reduced in cells lacking a taxin-3 in the uh, cell lines that I showed you before. Not the 3R, but of course the ratio, which is very relevant for disease, is perturbed. Um, we, also, we saw this also in primary neurons cultured from the brain of mice. When we silence the toxin 3, the same thing happens. Um, uh, and here we use the mutant of a toxin 3 that does not have catalytic activity, and we see the same effect as when it's absent. We also see that uh, the proteins interact, the splicing factor and ta uh, taxin-3, with two different methods, and they are interacting in the nucleus, which is where it makes sense. And so our proposal is that when a taxin-3 is not there, it is uh, not allowing this inclusion to occur, and then we have a 4-R perturbation. Uh, so what's the functional consequence of this? When we look at cells lacking a taxin-3, because this has to do with microtubule uh, elongation and also process elongation in neurons, we see that the processes of neurons in culture when we silence a taxin-3 are reduced. There's less complexity of the arbors, there's less length. Um, and now we looked at the model of disease. So is this relevant at all for the disease? Uh, when we take the same cell line but now express a mutant expanded a taxin-3, we have reduction of the, again, a, pro a problem in splicing overall and a reduction of the 4R and change of the ratio. Um, and the same thing happens in the mouse brains uh, and also uh, in different, um, sorry, this is, yeah, this is in the mouse brains and this is in the human pons, okay? So the, we see this ratio change in human brains. Uh, and again, the cultured uh, neurons, uh, in the, actually the brains, the neurons in the brain are also less complex in terms of their arborization. So this seems to be relevant in vivo and seems to be perturbed this function in the model of disease. So um, I took this picture from a very nice review uh, showing the links between the normal functions of proteins involved in ataxias and the disease uh, model uh, processes. And if you see, there are several of, of, the, of them that are related to RNA splicing and metabolism. And, uh, but this was not yet here shown for uh, taxin-3. There was no suggestion of what would be the targets. So my suggestion is that we can add to this figure that a taxin-3 is also related to these processes and that they may, may be relevant overall for a taxis. I'm finishing before the end. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> so much pressure. <laughs> Thank you.
had acknowledgements, but I don't know where they went. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you very much for stressing the importance of the nuclear utilization of ethics in green. So, in the last presentation, uh, I think you would have mentioned it uh, if you would have, but I'm asking this anyway. Did you have a chance to uh, check uh, in uh, ethics in green knockout mice whether, like, the uh, uh, consequence of this splicing difference have a long term impact in this adolescence? They, were, yeah. they are described to be, have no phenotype, but, like, if such yeah. a, a splicing of such a Sure, it's a major lack in my lab that we don't have the knockout mouse. I, I need to. I, it's not as you say; it doesn't have a phenotype. But uh, for many experiments, I I feel the need of having this mouse. I haven't I haven't looked in the um, in the knockout mouse brains. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. It's interesting that you mentioned that because in some of the tauopathies, so the ratio change that we see is opposite, for instance, to that of frontal temporal dementia in which the 4R is increased rather than decreased. But I think for PSP, it's the opposite. And so it's more close, which clinically is closer, I would say, to a taxin 3 than the, the FTD. So, but nobody, I don't think anybody has looked. Yeah. Thank you.